for this example, we are now nesting a for loop inside of a while loop. This is the opposite of what we'd seen in the past, where we had nested a while loop inside of a for loop. So let's get to it. The stuff on the inside takes constant time. The for loop there is nice and easy to analyze. This for loop takes ci time, and we can even do better and include that i equals 2i in there. All of the stuff inside of the while loop takes ci time. Now this is where we need to be careful because we cannot express the while loop easily as a summation. So let's create our trace table for the while loop and see how we can combine that with the information we've already generated about this problem. So I'm going to do it in this pink color. We have iteration and we have the value of the while loop, which is i. The while loop starts at one and how are we updating i? Well, we're continually multiplying by two. So after one iteration, we have two. After two iterations, we have four. We've seen this several times. After k iterations, we have two to the k. We want to identify when does that terminate? Well, it stops when the value of our loop variable i, to, which is two to the k here, is equal to the stopping condition of the while loop, which is n. Solve for k by taking a log base two of both sides. So that tells me the number of iterations. And now this is where we need to be very careful. We know what values i takes on from our iteration table that we've created there. So the cost of the first iteration of the while loop I'm going to write this down. Cost of first iteration would be c times i, but we know what i is on that first iteration of the while loop. It's 1. The cost of the second iteration is c times the next value i takes. cost of third iteration would be c times the next value it takes. And we would do this cost of the kth iteration, which is the last iteration based on what we called k earlier, would be c times 2 to the k, but we know what that equals. It's going to be c times n. So the total cost would be add up the cost of every single one of the iterations. So t of n is equal to the first iteration cost c, the second iteration cost 2c, the third iteration cost 4c, the next iteration would have cost 8c, then 16c, all the way up until we have c times n. There are several ways we could analyze this. I will show you my preferred method, but however you choose to analyze it is totally fine by me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to factor out the largest value of this summation, which is going to be that c times n at the end there. So we have cn. The first term then becomes 1 over n, then 2 over n, 4 over n, plus 8 over n, plus, and we keep going. We need to be careful what is the term that comes before c times n? Well, that would be c times n over 2. The way we advanced our terms was by multiplying by 2. We had 1 and then 2 and then 4 and then 8. The way that we go backwards would be dividing by 2. So if the last term was cn, if I factored out a cn, I would have a 1 left over. The term before that would be half as much, so 1 half plus the term before that is a fourth, plus the term before that would be an eighth. This looks very messy as it's written. I'm going to write it in the exact opposite order, and it will turn out to be much, much, much nicer to look at. So I'm going to reorder the terms and write the largest term first, which is one plus a half plus a fourth plus an eighth plus all the way down until we get to one over n. Now, 
what are we going to do? This turns out to be very easy to bound. This is a geometric progression. We can, uh, we can bound this above in a very convenient way. Let us do that. So we're going to bound this above. I'm going to bound it above by an infinite geometric series. So bound this above by c times n of 1 plus a half plus a fourth plus an eighth plus all the way up until infinity with no n. And if you were a good calculus student, you might remember that this has a very convenient formula. This is equal to that entire infinite summation would be 1 over 1 minus the common ratio, which is a half. And that simplifies to 2. 1 over a half is just 2, so this is 2 cn. To bound this below is also quite easy. The stuff in blue has told me that it's bounded above by some constant, 2c, times n. Now I need to bound it below by some constant times n. The easy way to do that is to just throw every single term in the summation except for the first. If I get rid of everything except the first term in the summation, the 1, then I would be left with cn times 1. So cn there. So it's bounded above by 2cn and bounded below by cn. Therefore, the summation must be in theta of n. So our final conclusion. So, t of n is in theta of n. A very common mistake to make on problems like this is to severely overcount the number of terms or be, to be very, very aggressive in your bounding above. What I mean by that is if I had replaced every single term in this original summation, with c times n, I would have had cn log n of times, which would give me an upper bound of big O of n log n. And while that is a valid upper bound, you cannot bound this below in a way to obtain n log n as a lower bound, because this is in theta of n. So be very careful when you get these sort of geometric progressions in these problems, because you want to make sure that you don't overcount when you're bounding, and then lead yourself down some bad rabbit hole that you hard to get out.